Hello and a warm welcome to this special edition of Invest Africa. I'm Godfrey Motizwa. Now, the city of Cape Town is currently playing host to the annual Africa Mining in Daba, where the top mining CEOs and Africa's government leaders have come to discuss, debate, and dissect issues and opportunities within Africa's mining industry. This is the 19th year that the Indaba has been held on African soil. Earlier this week, I caught up with some of the attendees to share their expectations of this year's event, as well as what they regard as some of the key issues affecting the mining industry on the continent. I think coming out of this Indaba uh, for us is as the reassurance uh, by government and also by labor that uh, there is a scope for us to work together, you know. The challenges that the mining industry is facing at the moment are not insurmountable challenges. What is important is a commitment, you know, from all of us, from business, uh, from government, and from labor, to find lasting solutions. Is that will there? What's your sense? Look, I think the will is there. Uh, but I think that somehow we miss one another. You know, we need to find a place where we can both commit to a, a common set of uh, values, a common vision, and a common sense of identity. You know, I'm almost inclined to say that uh, we, we, we need a, a mining codesk, you know, where we just reaffirm you know, what it is that we want to, uh, to get out of the mining industry. And what is it going to take? In other words, what is the respective and the relative role of each of the players in the mining industry? You know, when you're talking about the wheel, is that unless we, we, we really entrench our sense of commitment, we're going to keep on changing goalposts. I think that uh, the mining industry is uh, ready and, and willing to invest uh, to the extent that we've got uh, a predictable regulatory framework. We also have a better sense of some of the key drivers you know, of growth, one of them being the issue of the, the quality and the quantity of investments in infrastructure, and, and also some of the, the, the tariffs. I mean, you know, at the moment, you know, ESCOM is proposing a multi-year price determination on electricity. These are significant input costs and that affect the, the, the mining production. Having said that, we're very much aware of our own obligation, yeah. you know, as a mining company, in terms of ensuring that uh, you, we, we, we're active as employers, uh, and also making sure that we respond, you know, positively to the issues of the mining charter, for example, yeah. uh, and to other national transformation imperatives. So we are alive to that, but what we need is that kind of a dialogue yeah. that reaffirmed the relative commitments of all of these parties, you know, and I'm hoping that, you know, in this mining endeavor, you know, yeah. there'll be a reaffirmation, you yeah. know, of those kinds of conversations, and hoping also that post the endeavor, yeah. there'll be firm plans and programs that will then give uh, more impetus, you know, to that. The African continent is endowed with an abundance of mineral wealth including 40% of gold, 60% cobalt and 90% of the world's platinum group metal reserves. Both local and international mining companies are looking to extract this wealth, evoking political pressure on African governments to take a more proactive and strategic role in the mining sector, including facilitating open and clear dialogue between business, government and labor. I would like to indicate that the quality and the caliber of the dialogue between uh, the government and the mining sector has been increasingly improving. And therefore, in the past six months, we have been dialoguing really at a deeper level. We are getting to understand and cooperate with each other far better than we have done before. Yes, in the past, we have cooperated but uh, the developments of the past six months have indicated that we really need to deepen and broaden our dialogue. I would imagine we are not perhaps where we want to be. In terms of the private sector and its requirements, what more do you think ought to be done? Is it the government that should be coming forward and saying to the private sector, guys, you need to be talking to us more, or it's an approach that's needed from both sides? I think there is an approach needed from both sides. 
for the government and the mining sector is the relationship of partnership. Yeah. And that partnership, I think there is a challenge for us as the mining industry to communicate early, to communicate clearly, to communicate honestly with the government. And the government has got to reciprocate that. In the similar fashion, the communication with the union leadership, yeah. we need to do the same. And we have been communicating, sometimes we have been missing each other. But also we have stakeholders, and sometimes the stakeholders, especially the investors or shareholders, are not as well understood as they should be. And I think we need to say, let them be understood that they require the returns on their investments. But we need to persuade them as well to moderate the returns that they require so that we say all the stakeholders need to sustainably benefit from the mining industry. Now, some people would go so far as to say the relationship between government and the private sector is actually poison and that the atmosphere needs to be transformed for there to be meaningful dialogue between the two parties. From where you sit, how far and how long do you think it will take to get the two parties together? I can't say the relationship and the communication between the government or even the union and the chamber or the mining industry is poisoned. I'll be saying it has areas of improvement and we are improving those. It is my considered opinion that probably within a space of three to six months, our communication is going to be at the level where it could be and should be. We are looking at the problems which we are faced with which our minister has stated the triplets of unemployment, poverty and inequality and we need to deal with those issues and we are dealing with them and we're improving the cooperation and dealing with them. We all need to work very hard to narrow the gap between government, business and all the stakeholders in the mining industry. You know, Godfrey, if I look at the mining industry, shareholders want returns in the short term, uh, communities want to be developed, government want taxes, they want their fair share, and it's marrying all of those objectives that will bring a sustainable model for mining. Yeah. Now you of course advise private companies about, mm. about investments and working with governments and those kind of things. From where you sit in terms of the distrust, particularly from international investors, what do you think it will take for the government to win back international investor confidence again? You know, I don't think it is only for the government. It's for our whole country to portray a positive image. Uh, I was at the, uh, at the time when Marikana happened. I was in America. And it was spooky to see uh, 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 it uh, on, on the television screens, uh, the way we protest. So I do think it is everyone in South Africa have a duty to come together yeah. and portray a more positive image of our country. It's not only government, it is not only business, it is every man in the street need to take up their task as a good citizen to start to work together in the way we protest in the way we work together, we need to take hands. To date, the increase in mining exploration development on the continent has been primarily focused on gold and diamond exploration. Although there is still great scope for these commodities, riding on the back of improving base metal prices, this sector could see an increase in both activities and investment. We're seeing a lot of interest in Africa right now, as you know, Godfrey. Um, some of this, and most of it, in fact, is resources-driven. And therefore, um, you know, the countries that are obviously resource-rich um, in, you know, um, when you look at um, southern Africa, for instance, out north of South Africa, um, we're seeing a lot of interest in Zambia, in Zimbabwe, um, notwithstanding what's happening there in the DRC, which is, um, has always been uh, the case, but uh, the challenge there, as you know, is always been um, governance issues in, and in terms of both uh, the corporate and the country-related uh, risks. Yeah. Um, but we're also seeing um, a new kid on the block, South Sudan. We're seeing a lot of interest happening there. What's going on there? Well, what's, hap what's going on there is uh, the traditional um, resource uh, wealth that South Sudan has, which is... Um, energy-based, 
and oil base specifically. And then, you know, to the extent that South Sudan is looking at um, moving away from its reliance on the north, um, they're looking to increase their reliance on relationships in the south. And because of this, this has opened up um, whole uh, new opportunities, whether it's with um, relation to pipelines for the oil or with relation to refinerying for the oil or with relation to just general marketing arrangements um, for that oil. So when we look at the interest that you've been able to generate and that you are seeing coming into Africa, surely it gives the lie to this whole assertion that capital is a coward. When you look at the places where it's going, I mean, South Sudan is virgin territory. You look at Zimbabwe and the issues that they're dealing with, that's also a very difficult operating environment. Is it because this country is, have got uh, resources that perhaps you can't find anywhere on, else, uh, anywhere on earth, or is it just you know, simply the fact that you know, where there's a return, risk will come? Well, I can tell you, uh, if I had believed capital is a coward, I would not be where I'm standing. <laughs> but uh, definitely what we have seen is that, um, you know, capital is always looking for well-structured risk. Um, so this, the challenge is always um, to, to, to look at um, the particular structure that you're originating and then try to fit it within what capital um, and what the capital markets will generally um, applaud. Um, but obviously, you know, uh, uh, this, there's no vacuum. There's no such thing as a, a total lacuna in the capital space. As you know, recently, um, we've had um, China, we've had India, we've had Brazil, all of them, and Russia included, uh, all of them looking at um, Africa from, from a, a very interesting perspective and from, with different eyes. Yeah. But uh, additionally, we have the traditional uh, markets um, in the West that continue to look at it. Yeah. But all that has happened, at least in my uh, recent experience, is that it has become very competitive in the African space because this Africa is literally um, being spoken of as the last frontier, and I am seeing it from the practical perspective. Yeah. Now, a lot of it has been said about uh, private equity activity across Africa. There's been a suggestion that uh, there's a lot of fundraising that's going on for Africa-focused projects. In terms of uh, the returns that you've been seeing, has that been justified? And also in terms of the pricing for some of the equity as well as uh, capital that's coming into Africa, what sort of trends have you been picking up? Well, you know, the interesting trend uh, is the one I started out with, the Chinese trend, for instance. Um, China has been a very big game changer in terms of traditional private equity structures. Um, what the Chinese um, will normally do is that they will look at um, smart joint ventures and partnerships where they, they will work and then obviously introduce the element of um, long-term Chinese uh, development capital at a very low cost. And then, of course, um, we've got our traditional friends on the Western Front who basically have uh, emphasized over the recent past in terms of um, creating funds that are Africa-focused, uh, but more funds that are sector-focused. We are going for a short commercial break. More Invest Africa when we return. Welcome back. You're watching this special edition of Invest Africa. Over the past six months, mine violence has become synonymous with South Africa given the labor unrest that has gripped the country's mining sector. The events at Marikana and the numerous wildcat strikes around the country have shaken both local and international investors. With mining accounting for over half of South Africa's foreign exchange earnings, how do you allay investor concerns in regards to the future of the mining industry? We we'll travel to the 19th annual Invest in Africa Mining Indaba to find out. What is key for us as South Africa is to make sure that policies which we come up with as a country are able to recognize that as a country, investors play a critical role in ensuring that we achieve our own objective as government. So we cannot say our policies are such that they cannot recognize that for us to be able to be functional, for us to be able to meet our objectives, we do need investment in South Africa. Hence, we are mindful 
on the policies which we pass and ensuring that they continue to attract investment, but at the same time balance that with our social needs or our needs as a country. We have a good mineral endowment, yeah. but in order to get people to invest, it must be a stable investment platform, Godfrey. Yeah. Mining is easy. Mining investors want a couple of things. Right. They invest big time, yeah. and it's a long-term investment. They want stability over the long term. Right. They want to know what to expect. You know, if you come in and invest in a big project that will run for 30 years, yeah. you cannot get the taxes change in year 10 all yeah. of a sudden. Yeah. You need to know what to expect over the lifetime of your project. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously, it's the question of labor. We in a country where we need to create more jobs and I do think the unions and business yeah. can do a lot in creating a more harmon um, harmonious way yeah. in taking it forward. How scared are they internationally? Give me a sense of uh, the oh, kind of conversations that you have. It's, it's a very difficult, it ranges. Uh, it ranges and I think uh, you know, I always try and tell people, at least in South Africa, yeah. I feel our risks are quantifiable. We have a stable law, a legal system in yeah. South Africa. Yeah. We have very formal structures in South Africa. So I portray, try and portray and give them the positives of our structure. Sure. But as I say, the, the, the elements that we need to manage yeah. is the so socio-economic element the, the gap between the rich and the poor yeah, that they is scared of that. they are scared of that Although South Africa remains the biggest mining economy on the continent, equating for 15% of all known gold reserves and 87% of the world's platinum group metals, other African economies are also showing promise. Certainly, I know, I don't think there are many people who know that Guinea has the largest bauxite reserves in the world, nor are there many people who know that Guinea actually rivals Brazil and potentially South Africa as home to some of the largest deposits of iron ore in the world. So let's talk about the potential of mining in Guinea. How big is it? Really, the potential of uh, the mining sector in Guinea is a huge. Iron ore, we have already a potential of 40 billion ton uh, of iron ore, bauxite. The potential is uh, the same proportion, 40 billion. And the proven reserve for bauxite is about 20 billion metric ton of bauxite. Then you have gold, you have diamond, you have, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, uranium. So it's really a, a, a blessing of, of God. Yeah. So what are you doing then to get investment into the sectors? We know that you have been looking at revising your mining code in order to be able to attract more investment. Talk to us about some of the changes that you are either introducing or amending or reforming within that mining code. Uh, thank you. But first of all, I can tell you that uh, to attract you know, the investment in my country, you know, as you may know, Gini had his first uh, election, democratic election in 2010. Then we started, you know, to put in place the reform. The first reform was, you know, the elaboration of a new mining code. The second was, uh, you know, uh, the mining review. The third was, in, uh, you know, the clean up of our mining cadastre. Right. Coming back to the mining code, you know, we elaborated the mining code and promulgated in uh, uh, September 11, uh, 2000, uh, 2011, and. When we promulgated, yeah. we did face to some observation for the mining industry. Yes. It's very simple to understand that at this moment, the mining industry was completely down. The financial crisis impacted the, the sector. Yes. And uh, we were obliged to face you know, the two factors. Plus the fact that Guinea, having you know, those a huge reserve potential of bauxite yes. is located in Atlantic Basin. The Atlantic Basin is the Atlantic market. We are competing with uh, the Pacific right. uh, 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 region, right. including China, India, Indonesia, 
Vietnam, yeah. uh, even uh, 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 Philippines. Philippines as well. As well. You know, the crisis of this region, they're a producer and they're a consumer. Right. And Guinea is only producer. And you're on the other side of the Ex world. Or the, the other side of the world. And I'm taking, you know, the Guinean box set to the Pacific region, yeah. you know, it's a roughly 25 uh, US dollar. And uh, knowing that the uh, metric ton price of the box set is $28, you see, okay. our Okay, so the margin set, is very small. Exactly, our uh, box set is not any more competitive. Okay. That's why, you know, we listen uh, to the business leader, uh, their observation, so it's true, and uh, addressing two, you know, the two uh, previous factors, we were, uh, you know, inclined to re revise the, the new mining code. Okay. Bringing some uh, on the table, some aspect as, you know, the f fiscal regime. Well, the most important message to them is that uh, Tanzania is the country that offers all opportunities that you want in the mineral sector. We are a country that is endowed with all types of minerals that you find on this planet. We have gold, we have base metals, lead, zinc, copper, we have platinum, uh, we have the technology metals that are on demand today, such as titanium, um, uh, uh, tantalum, uh, they are all found in Tanzania. We have also the energy uh, minerals, uh, such as uranium. Uh, we have also the energy sources, such as cop um, uh, coal, with an enormous amount of uh, deposits that we have. For instance, our conservative estimate of the coal deposits is, around, is above 1.5 billion tons of coal. So I would say Tanzania is the best place to make investment, and the environment is conducive. Uh, we have the political stability. We are a very reliable, uh, low-binding country. Uh, there is no corruption. So that is the message I'm giving to the people. One of the issues that investors, when they talk about Africa these days, is of course the whole issue of resource nationalism, which has come in different guises, from uh, government seeking higher taxes to involvement of the community, and also, of course, the whole issue around uh, uh, mining royalties and all those other things. From Tanzania's perspective, what are you doing and what are you saying about dealing with those highly, highly contentious issues? Well, insofar as uh, uh, fiscal regimes is concerned, I would say Tanzania is very predictable and doing very well. We have our mineral policy of 2009, which actually shows the roadmap towards the investment in the mining sector. We have the Mining Act of 2010. And uh, in, in the case of uh, oil and gas, we have the Petroleum Act, which is under review of 1980. And uh, we are soon going to complete uh, the uh, gas policy, which uh, actually has been interrogated by all the citizens of the country. What are you reviewing there? Uh, the, the, let me first it, go back to the minerals that you ask, and then you can ask me about the oil and gas. We have our taxation uh, slots are very well known. We have 4% royalty. We have 30% as a corporate tax, and then we have either 5 or 15% as withholding tax, depending on whether the company is incorporated in, in the country or outside the country. And then we have 0.3% of the turnover for the local governments. So ours are very transparent and they're very well known, and they will respect the contracts that we enter into with the companies. So that is why we say Tanzania is the destination for, 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 for investment because uh, our, our investment climate is, uh, is sound, predictable, and reliable. And we, don't have, we do not go into the discussion of nationalization because we think they want to work. And maybe this is something I have to tell my colleagues on the African continent. Professionally, I'm a geologist and uh, I have been working on geology for many, many years since I graduated in 1979. You need the private sector if you have to do serious mining. If you are in oil and gas,